Hi, my name is Darren Gertis, and uh, I'm a professor who has been just following what's going on in Ukraine, and I'm trying to unpack it for people daily so that they understand what's going on on the ground, what's going on politically, what's going on economically, and so here we go. So yesterday I talked about Russian general in charge of Ukraine operation speaks out, and I think he was signaling something. Dennis Davidoff said something along these lines too, like, it seems like something's about to happen here, and I think I can bring a little clarity to it, although it's somewhat speculative. So he was talking about how it may be difficult decisions ahead. It's, it's tense. And so he was signaling something. We're not sure what that is. Couple that with whenever uh, Ukrainian authorities kind of go dark, something big's about to happen and they just went dark. So that's another thing. And then you couple it with this. So here's the BBC, Ukraine war, Russians start leaving Ukraine's Kherson city. And so there's, they're making like a big thing of civilians fleeing. Okay. So, but watch. Tuesday night, residents in Herzon started receiving text messages urging them to evacuate immediately. The messages said transport across the Dnipro River uh, would be available uh, from 7 on Wednesday. They're told to evacuate because the evil Ukrainians are going to shell the city, one resident told the BBC, asking to remain anonymous. People are panicking because of propaganda. But is something else potentially going on? I don't know, but here's the speculation. Uh, but Ukrainian officials have questioned whether large numbers of people are actually being evacuated evacuated or suggesting that uh, images of crowds assembled are, on the river are largely for show. And the idea is that this is deportation theater that could act as cover for a much bigger Russian move, a complete military evacuation of the west bank of the river. So the bridges are blown. If they're trying to get people out, if they're getting civilians out, that's different than military and that you wouldn't, you know, rain down your rockets on. And so I think that might be what's going on. I don't know. This is just what my gut is telling me. It's it's speculation. And when I'm speculating, I'm going to tell you it's just speculation. Okay. The financial toll on Ukraine of downing drones vastly exceeds Russian costs. I absolutely hate to say this, but the Russians have made a smart move here and it's costing the Ukrainians more than the Russians with the drones. Okay, so I'm not on the Russian side at all. I'm, I'm just explaining what's going on. The cost of Ukraine of downing kamikaze drones being fired at its cities vastly exceeds the sums paid by Russia in sourcing and launching the cheap drones. So they estimate that the, the cost of the drones that they're sending in are something like 11 to uh, $17.9 million. And Ukraine has to deploy missiles to defend against that to try to shoot these drones down and the cost to Ukraine to try to shoot these down even though some are getting through is 28.14 28.14 million dollars so it's let's say double ish right something in that neighborhood um you can't not do it. You have to do it, but it's costing you more. This is like one of the first smart things from the military perspective that Russia has done yet. Um, and I'm, I don't want it to be. I hate the idea that this is happening, but the Russians are using these well. So this is utterly brilliant, but there is a snag, and that is that they have short sourced these Shahid 136 drones from Iran, Israel's arch enemy. And so Israel's now kind of really thinking about what they might be able to do to help. Uh, where they were trying to be neutral because there are Israelis, dis, uh, you know, Jews are dis dispersed all over the world, including in Russia. And so they've been trying to be neutral, uh, but they might not be as neutral. About 60% of these drones have been destroyed by one uh, estimate, up to 80% of the two, uh, 208 Shahid 136 launched on October 17th were shot down. 70% uh, of those, those launched before daylight on noon. Okay, so they're getting a lot of them down, but it's costing them a lot. Now, what I was just talking about was... This, Israel's defense minister opposes sending weapons to Ukraine. They don't want to get involved in the conflict because there are Jews in Russia, just like there are Jews in Ukraine. And they, they really, I mean, their interest, remember, I talked about follow the interest the other day. If you followed the interest, you understand, like, I understand why Israel has not gotten involved. They have their own issues. They have their own um, problems with uh, Islamists around them. And they have to think about defending themselves. They have to think about the dispersed Jews around the world. And they didn't want to get involved. He says, I want to make it clear that we do not sell weapons to Ukraine. I'm the Minister of Defense. I'm responsible for the export of Israeli weapons. And he doesn't want these weapons falling into other hands. However, Israel's defense minister says that they're not going to supply 
uh, Ukraine with weapons. Defense Minister Benny Gantz on Wednesday reiterated Israel would not supply Ukraine with weapons to fight. However, they said Israel supports and stands with Ukraine, NATO, and the West. This is something we have said in the past and we repeat today. Israel has a policy of supporting Ukraine via humanitarian aid, which is not nothing. This is actually very helpful and delivery of life-saving defensive equipment. And that's because they have this, like, wherever our diaspora is, whether they're Jews in Russia or Ukraine, we want to be, and so they've, they've struck a much more neutral tone. But they also said that they might be able to uh, provide defensive warning systems. And Israel's defensive warning system is first class, second to none in the world. The warning system uses a mix of radar, electro-optic devices to detect rocket, missile, and drone launches, classify the size and the threat that they represent, and pinpoint on a map the area's that are in danger. So, uh, okay, it's not nothing. It's it's a helpful thing. And it only came because these were Iranian drones that the Russians chose to use. And Ira Iran is um, Israel's mortal enemy. So we're following Iran's involvement in the war. And we see that Iran provides UAVs and in the near future may also provide additional advanced systems. So uh, the more that Russia uses Iranian equipment, the more Israel's willing to be helpful. Okay, next article. So this is going to be a tough winter. It just is. And it um, Russia made a tactical mistake. And the tactical mistake was doing this energy strike, the strike on energy power plants now rather than a month and a half from now when it's really starting to get cold and stay cold because now you have a chance to figure out a backup plan work things out get get this all sorted out where in, as in you know in a month or two it's not going to be the same Zelensky said that 30 percent of the country's power stations have been knocked out in just eight days at one point Ukraine used to supply a European energy like they were plugged into the grid and some, a net exporter of energy to Europe and now they're facing rolling blackouts. Um, and, and they said this, they, there could even be a renewed migration crisis as people seek to leave the country in pursuit of warmth. One international aid agency, which did not want to be named, estimated that could, there could be as many as 2 million additional people on top of the 7.7 .7 million who have already left. And so the Russians know what they're doing. This is a very cruel, I was going to say cold, but I'm not trying to pun. I'm just, it's a very cruel policy of what they're, they're doing, what they're inflicting on their civilian population in Ukraine. This one made me really angry. Ukrainians design new body armor for children. Children should not need body armor. And I, I, don't, I, just, I can't even explain how angry this made me. No child should have to say, I, it's strong. I think this would protect me from shrapnel. I mean, this... Mm. Okay, anyway, let me keep going. Uh, I'm just raising my own blood pressure. Putin declares martial law in four annexed occupied areas of Ukraine, uh, and the law published gives far-reaching powers to the Russian-installed head of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Herzon provinces. Um, and so what did we expect was going to happen, right? You annex these four areas, and then you uh, draw on those people for extra troops and other things. Now, uh, I'm going to show you the RT version in just a little bit, before we do that, let's look at Putin's actual statement and see what he had to say here. I'm just going to show you about 10 seconds, 15 seconds of this. Shelling continues and civilians are killed. The neo-Nazis are using blatantly terrorist methods, sabotaging vital facilities and arranging assassination attempts on representatives of the local authorities. Donetsk People's Republics, Luhansk People's Republic, and Herzan and Zaporizhia regions had martial law regime in force before they were incorporated into Russia. Now we need to formalize the regime with the framework of Russian legislation. Okay, you know, if you do something legally after you illegally annexed, it's still not legal. So, you know, but he's thinking he's going through these hoops and somehow that's making it legal. Um, okay, next. As the war drags on, Ukrainian troops have spent months on end in combat, and they're really, really tired. I mean, really tired. The intense fighting persists with no sign of a let-up, and Kiev is increasingly confronted with the psychological hardships of keeping troops in combat without relief for such long stretches. And that's really 
really a problem. Uh, I am not a military authority on this, uh, but this is what this person's saying. If a unit remains on the front line for a long time, then its combat capability gradually decreases. Combat capability can be maintained for about 40 days. I do not know. I do not claim to know, but let's say that that's true. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. But for that reason, I think this is very fair, the next article, that the brave people of Ukraine become the winner of the European Parliament's Sakharov Prize. And I think it's ironic as well. The winner of the Sakharov Prize of the European Parliament was the Ukrainian people. They're standing up for what they believe in, fighting for our values, protecting democracy, freedom, and the rule of law, risking their lives for us. The Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought is a human, human rights prize established in 1998. Why? By the European Parliament in honor of Soviet physicist and human rights activist, Andrei Sakharov. So it's it's kind of a, a nice ironic twist. Okay, next, here's some fun with Russian state media. Okay, so Erdogan and Putin agreed to build a major gas hub in Turkey. Now, I told you the other day, follow the interest. Erdogan is not Ukraine's friend. He's not Russian's friend. He's Turkey's friend, and he will work with Ukraine where he can, and he'll work with Russia where he can. And here, he's talking about building a pipeline of gas into Europe through Turkey, which is enabling his interest, but it's like he's wor he works with whoever to uh, accommodate his interest. And I think if you understand this article, if you understand that, that he's doing what he's doing because his interests are distinct from Ukraine and distinct from Russia, but he'll work with either side, you understand a lot of how different parties are thinking throughout this whole conflict. And I talked about that in this one, how to understand what's happening in Ukraine. And, and please go back and watch that. If you understand the interest, you'll understand a lot of what's going on. Okay, uh, next, this is in Pravda. Putin's new decree, martial law, levels of readiness and territorial defense. Now, we already talked about martial law to some degree. And here are the, new, the powers that are written out with martial law. But then they said, it's worthy of note that martial law was in effect in the above mentioned territories before they became part of the Russian Federation. Well, yeah, when they were occupied, they were under martial law. Okay, I... That's fair, but that doesn't really mean a lot. It's just, it was occupied, and now you have the garb of legality that's not really legal. Okay, here's the last one, and that is, there is a billionaire, American billionaire, Bill Ackerman, who, he's, hey, he has a peace plan. Huh, how about that? Ukraine should recognize Crimea as part of Russia, renounce its bid to join NATO for the sake of peace, uh, says U.S. billionaire hedge fund manager Bill Ackerman. RT is loving this. Why is RT loving this? Think about what, what Russia gets or what Ukraine gets as you look at his plan. Crimea was part of Russia until 1954, and it's largely comprised of e ethnic Russians, which apparently is why the world did little when Russia annexed it back in 2014. That's not the only reason. The, the reason is that nobody knew, whoa, whoa, what's going on? What are they doing? It was kind of a sucker punch and they weren't ready for it. Now they're ready for it and it's a different story. But this argument is kind of bad when you think about all the other people who owned Crimea at one point or another. He added that the border should return to where they were prior to February 24th, which would still give Russia the part that they illegally uh, occupied before that or illegally annexed with a 97% vote in Crimea. So again, two for Russia, zero for Ukraine, right? Uh, he added that the West should help then help Kiev with its recovery. Okay, one for Ukraine, uh, but they were going to get that anyway. Like it's not nothing. There's so it's really zero extra for Ukraine, and the country should stay outside of NATO. That's three for Russia, zero for Ukraine, and that's really what this amounts to. And he can't understand why he got pushback. Yesterday, I suggested that a reasonable peace settlement, and then the knives came out, and I was accused of being an appeaser and worse. If you do this, Putin will be back in 10 years to take more ground, and it's it's pretty obvious. So he asks, is Ukraine better off on a continued prolonged war that leads to 1,000 more Ukrainian deaths and the leveling of the country, or does some kind of negotiated settlement makes make sense? Okay, so when are the Ukrainians then? This is what I would like to ask you, Bill. When are the Ukrainians going to get back their stolen children who have been kidnapped? When are reparations going to be made for leveling the country? When are the oil revenues going to be used to pay for rebuilding Ukraine instead of it being the West burden? This is no peace plan. This is an appeasement plan. 
I call for peace. I call for Russia to provide peace by returning illegally annexed land. Illegally annexed land that the UN recognized at like 143 to 5 was illegally annexed land. Then you can have some peace. Then you can make the reparations that need to be made. But this is nonsense. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with me and being the kind of person that cares enough about Ukraine to listen to me rant and rave.